So you've transitioned nicely since uh, leaving the world of professional wrestling, huh? Seems like well, you're very the happy. Is, it, the thing about me is I always had something else besides wrestling. Uh, mm. I worked in strip clubs all my life. I eventually, I eventually bought into Cheetahs in Las Vegas. I was one of the owners. The whole time that I was wrestling, I always had money coming in from Cheetahs. So that's one reason you would see me come and go so much is because, and I'm just going to be honest, I was there to have fun. Of course, make some money, but I was there to have fun. And back then, I wanted to be around big, strong, crazy people that were just as stupid as I was. And I wanted, and it was fun being around those type of people. So because the fact that I always had a means of making money, when I was not having fun, I'm like, hey, man, I'm wrestling the Dudley Boys going through a table every night. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, this traveling. Man, I could be at home looking at naked women making just as much money. So that's why you'd see me come and go is because when I wasn't having fun, I'd, I'd go to Vince and say, hey, Vince, I ain't having fun, man. And Vince be Charles, okay, Charles, okay. I'd be like, nah, man, I want to go home, you know. And so I would leave. He goes, well, go on home and let us know when you want to come back. And I swear, I wouldn't call him back. And they'd call me and say, hey, Charles, uh, what about this? Hey, but I'd be like, no. No, it got to the point it'd be funny because I just keep telling them no. And then they didn't and then Taker would call me or something, say, Hey man, come on, buddy. Uh, I'm like, no, nah, take I ain't doing that, you know. So anyway, that's why you'd see me come and go so much. Godfather, speaking of big, strong, crazy guys, and speaking of the Undertaker, uh, we all know that you and and uh take very, very good friends. We recently saw him Brothers. last week on NXT, giving everybody the rub and closing out the show. Tell us about your relationship with the dead man these days. Talk to us about your friendship and what it's like today. Well, I, after seeing that, I called him and I told him, I said, hey, bro, you better be careful. You're going to take out those brand new knees. <laughs> he said, nah, nah, nah. I just did Sean a favor. <laughs> and uh our relationship now it's always been we're we're not wrestling bros we're not, i mean we're brothers man and i love that dude and we met each other in 87 and uh i had a lot to do with changing the way he is for the better and uh, we just became bros man and to this day very seldom do we ever talk wrestling we talk about our kids we talk about guns we talk about motorcycles we talk about life but the whole time that I know him, unless it was something very serious that just happened, um, we've never talked wrestling. Even to this day, we don't talk wrestling. Hey, Bully, this is going to trip you out. Godfather showed me a picture of dead man with no tattoos. Yeah. Yeah, way back when. But he, didn't, he didn't have tattoos when they met. Well, Godfather, when you say help change quote unquote change him for the better like can you give us a little more on that like okay. what do you what do you mean well it's, we, we got to go back a little bit at the time that i got into wrestling i mean i'm a biker i'm not no pretend weekend biker i'm a patch wearing biker and i'm used to being around big white dudes with tattoos that were kind of like me but uh i'm not used to being around big white dudes that aren't bikers or tattoos or drink whiskey or listen to country music or shoot guns, all that type of stuff. So when I met Taker, I was a little leery of him. I'm like, oh, here we go. Another one of them big white dudes. And I was the type of dude that you said the N word or something out of line with me. I just cracked it. That's how it was. And I'm like, oh, I'm about to crack this dude. So we wrestle, mind you, I'm as green as green can be. <laughs> so I wrestled Taker. The match goes horrible. Um, it was almost like a shoot to me to where I shot him into a turnbuckle one time and uh, the turnbuckle, the top turnbuckle exploded. It, it exploded. And we, I got on him again and then I tried to shoot him into that same turnbuckle with it missing. He reversed, throws me outside, grabs the chair, hits me with this chair as hard as you can. I see stars. He looks at me and says, you want to do this the easy way or you want to do this the hard way? And I said, I think we'll do this the easy way. And then we became good friends. But when I met him, Taker didn't, uh, I got in a car with him and he was listening to like Motley Crue and Metallica, shit like that. And I'm like, dude, what, what are you listening to, bro? And I'm like, yeah, Mark, you know, I, I something I didn't know, Mark Henry listens to country music. 
it, you surprised the hell out of me, all the country music you know. And so I, I got him into to country music. He didn't drink Jack Daniels. I'm like, big dog, you got to drink Jack, man. So he started <laughs> drinking Jack Daniels. <laughs> Um, he didn't have a so you saying you was a good influence, but yeah. a bad influence. Well, I just call him fake speech. He says, <laughs> I don't know if he's a good influence or bad, but he's been a big influence on me. And so he didn't write Harleys. I had to teach him how to ride a Harley. He didn't have any tattoos. So I said, Next time you come to Vegas, I don't care, you're getting tattooed. So me, him, and Paul Bear went down, got him tattooed. Hell's Angels were there. It was a cool situation, man. What but was his that, wow. What was his that's, first tat? That's his first tat. I wish I could send you the picture. Yeah, him, me, him, and Paul Bear is there, and he's sitting there, no tats, white skin. He, most people don't know he's a redhead, but that red beard, getting tattooed. But uh, yeah, man, that's uh, that's my bro. That's awesome. I mean, for you, and it's funny to hear you say that you got into this business for fun. Was I mean to make some money too? But it was really just about fun. And when you did that, and I guess that took the stress off because you're a Hall of Famer. Like, you're, you've had a career where people are going to talk about it 25, 50 years down the road. Like, how does that make you feel? Something that you kind of went in blind um, and were so successful and so remembered for. I went in blind, but I was serious about my work when I was there, even as the good father. I mean, I was very serious about it, but I was, I mean, I had, I was more, the fun was more at nighttime with me in, in the BSK and everything that we did. But, um, I mean, I took my job serious, and I, and I tried hard. And even as a good father, like I said, I tried hard. But I was there for the experience. And, and wrestling came to me. I wasn't even a wrestling fan. I didn't even watch wrestling. You know what I watched? I'm older than you guys. Roller Derby. Oh. In the 70, I grew up in the 70s in uh, Northern California. And, and, and Roller Derby was much bigger than wrestling, way bigger than wrestling. They'd be at the cow ballast, Haystack Calhouns and Ray the Crippler and people like that. They would draw half a house and roller derby come here and sell it out. And so wrestling kind of came to me. They were filming a movie called Over the Top. It was a Sylvester Stallone movie, arm wrestling movie. Scott Norton, a bunch of guys were in this movie. I was the manager, bartender, doorman, everything at this strip club called Crazy Horse, right down the street from the MGM where they filmed. Well, they would all come in. I don't know everybody's name. Most of the guys were extras. They're like, dude, you should know me. And at that time, I'm just jacked, dude. I'm, 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 bit, I'm powerlifting. I'm, anyway, so I'm like, ah, I don't want to do that wrestling stuff. And they're like, you know Bam Bam Bigelow? And I'm like, the dude with the tattoos. Yeah, I know him. They go, well, he made over a million dollars last year. And I went, wrestling? <laughs> Boy. Made that call right then, you know. And so <laughs> I, I called uh, Larry Sharp was, God rest his soul, was the, uh, he trained uh, Bam Bam at the Monster Factory. So I called him. Back then there was no cell phones and you couldn't just send a picture, that type of stuff. So when I showed up, dude, I'm, I'm every bit of 340, you know, tattooed mohawk. And Larry Sharp just looked to be like this. And, and that's where I got my start, man. How long did you wow. spend in the Monster Factory before you went out there and started uh, doing it? I, I hate to say this, but you guys know me. You know what the Godfather's like, and that ain't no gimmick. You guys know I am what I am. Ain't no gimmick. Okay, so instead Two of weeks. going to... Huh? Two <laughs> weeks? <laughs> instead of going to wrestling school, I'm taking guys out to strip clubs, picking up girls, bringing girls back to the... I, I think I went maybe six seven times this is what i knew how to do i knew how to lock up and for some reason i could do a drop down toe hold because i think i was there that day they were working on it well what happened is gary lawler seen me and guys i was a monster i mean i was just black tattooed chew tobacco list the country i was so different they didn't know what the hell to do with me and so jerry lawler seen me put me to work Never had a match, never had a practice match, never learned anything. And Jerry Lawler told me, I got in the ring with Jerry for a little while. He goes, just listen to me. He goes, do everything I tell you to do. And that's what I did. And it went pretty good, but I did whatever Jerry told me to do, I did. And then when they were done with me, with that program was over, they didn't know what to do with me because I'm green. That's when they brought Taker in. 
And we had such a terrible match that they made us tag team partners because they said Taker can maybe help teach you. And uh, they called us Death Express. And we had a short run, but then Taker went to WCW. And then I went to work for Otto Vons in Germany for a year. And, uh, you know, we met back up with the WWF at the time. When you were working with uh, Lawler, I'm assuming it's Memphis. What was your gimmick name then? I was the Soul Taker. Gotcha. Taker of Souls, which is actually this tattoo on my arm right here. They're thinking of a name for me, and they're like, well, what's the name of that tattoo on your arm? I'm the only, all my, I don't know if you ever noticed this, but all my tattoos got naked women on them. <laughs> Yeah. And so I said, that's the soul thing. It takes women's souls. And they said, I like that. Let's call you the soul taker. How did you get your shot with WWE and who gave you the, and who made the call? Um, I would assume Mark told him, uh, hey, I want you to check out my buddy. They gave me a call. I just got back from Germany. And, you know, I want to hear a weird thing. When I was over, you guys know Otto Vons, of course. God rest his yeah. soul. Listen to the card that was over there. Me, Scott Hall, Owen Hart, Chris Benoit, Fit Finley, Dave Taylor, Salvatore Bolomo, um, PM News. That's all the guys that were working there for eight months. And those guys are the ones that really helped me because over there you wrestle in rounds. You don't wrestle in rent, you know. And so uh, they really they really brought me along there. I went, to, I got a trial with WWE. In Arizona, I went down there, and they uh, they they called me Sir Charles because that's where Charles Barkley was playing. And they wanted to put some heat on me. They called me Sir Charles. I got my tryout. Vince hired me. They told me we're going to put you on payroll. We just they says, but our problem with you is you got a body of a monster, but you have a baby face. And they said we don't. We, we got to do something with your face. And they called me a couple months later, and Vince says Charles. <clears throat> I want you to rent the movie Live and Let Die. There's a voodoo character in there. And he goes, and most importantly, I want you to get down his laugh. The, <laughs> that laugh, the Uncola guy. So, I mean, that's where it started. So I went from being this hardcore biker dude to being a voodoo man. Dave, <laughs> did, wow, I can't believe you, that how similar our story is. Yeah. Like, oh, I really? never wrestled. I never wrestled a day in my life. And they put me with Jerry Lawler. And I my first match was a pay-per-view at In Your House with Jerry Lawler. I had never locked up with nobody. That's because anybody that's anybody that's anybody in this business that's older started with from Hogan. To, uh, doesn't matter how far rock, it doesn't matter how far you go. Everybody started in Memphis with Jerry Lawler. And that's the shoot. He's done more for wrestling than anybody breaking in new talent. I bet you. I, and I don't, and, no and I don't think there was anybody who could get more out of less than Jerry. Because look at all the green guys he brought in. And it worked. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mala, I mean, Bam, everybody has gone through there. Dave? We got about we got about 60 seconds. Can you give a quick uh, Bully Ray or Mark Henry story before we say goodbye? You know what? Only The only problem with my story, look at Mark laughing. Oh, Don't yeah. tell no stories about me. See, here, here's the problem. The thing, I don't have this normal wrestling stories. I got wild stories. So my stories get people in trouble. That's my, okay. my I'm not doing nothing. To, I ain't doing nothing to get anybody in trouble. All my wife listening that, right now. But my stories are more of an X-rated at nighttime of story with me. They break out segment promo whatever you want to call it for la night this past friday on smackdown why because he's in the ring with your undisputed wwe universal champion roman reigns and that was a moment that obviously got the fans going the sold out crowd on friday the yeah the la night and bully and mark we've heard a lot of the taglines come from L.A. Knight, but you go back to Friday and what L.A. Knight was saying to Roman Reigns, you got a lot more than just that. It wasn't just a scratch-the-surface moment for L.A. Knight. He talked about how he deserves to be where he is. He talked about how Roman Reigns has been sitting on his couch and he's been away. I think the last time we saw Roman Reigns 
was the Monday after SummerSlam. So it's been a long time since we've seen Roman Reigns. And Mark, you and Denise talked about this on Saturday. And as much as I liked Roman in that segment, as much as I liked LA Knight in that segment, I do have a bone to pick with what I saw on Friday night. And that was John Cena. As good as I thought LA Knight was on the microphone, was as bad as I thought John Cena was in the background. And I think it definitely took away a little bit from what L.A. Knight was saying on the mic on Friday night. It Go ahead. Time out, away. time out, time out. Mark, before you answer, Dave, can you just explain why you didn't like John Cena? I just want to get the full scope of this. Just because his overacting, the facial expressions, what he was doing while L.A. Knight was talking to Roman Reigns. The number okay, one cool. thing, Thank Lily, you. Mark, go ahead. Was the number one thing was drawing attention to himself. Yes. You cannot... When something is going on in the ring, I remember I did that with Ron Simmons one time. Once. Because he said, shut the fuck up on TV. <laughs> like, don't move. Don't say anything. Like, I'm working. And I drew attention away from him. And I wasn't supposed to say nothing, so I shouldn't have said nothing. And why not have John Cena, it, once that introduction and all that happened, they should have found a way to get him out of there. That's never going to happen. Well, I, we, we know the obvious reason why, because he's John Cena. But the only other option is for him to, like, this is not my business. I'm just going to stand here. I'm going to fly on the wall and just stand there but all of the antics and the hey look at me it, it took away from the segment a am i wrong no and 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 bully i want to get your take on this obviously we're going to talk a lot about this and i want to get the nation's take as well listen john cena has done a lot for la night you know go back to fast lane and that tag match that elevates an la night even with john cena starting and, and Bully, the way John Cena started the segment where, like, Roman comes out and was like, wait a second, you're not starting my show. This is my show. And then John Cena is like, I'm not here to challenge you. I'm here to acknowledge you. You're the champion. I have not earned the right to challenge you for that championship. And then he introduces yeah. – uh, yeah. And then he introduces L.A. Knight. Like, everything that John Cena has done since coming back to that moment is amazing, is perfect, and has helped L.A. Knight. So I got to give John Cena credit because it is John Cena. So up until the moment that we're about to talk to, what John Cena has done for L.A. Knight, I, I think even L.A. Knight would turn around and shake John Cena's hand and say thank you. But now you set... L.A. night up for that moment where he's on the microphone face-to-face -face with Roman Reigns. Now it's L.A. night's moment. Even John Cena acknowledges the fact that it's L.A. night's moment. That's where he needs to be in the background and not noticed. But, like, to Mark's point, Bully, John Cena made himself noticed. And, I, and I'll even go as far as to say this. It reminded me of some of the things I didn't like about John Cena. Let's, let's face it. John Cena, since he's come back, the fans love John Cena. When John Cena was the star of the WWE, that crowd was about 50-50 on John Cena. He had John Cena chance, John Cena sucks chance. It was, it was split down the middle. John Cena's a star. But some of the things that John Cena did during that segment kind of reminded me of, why at times fans would boo a John Cena. And he took a moment for LA Knight to shine. And I took, I think took some of that shine away and made it seem less serious, bully, because his facial expressions, like those weird facial expressions, the gyrations, the jumping up and down, the overacting, I think took a little bit of the seriousness of what was coming out of LA Knight's mouth away from him. And it's a bit of a shame because it was a great moment to start off SmackDown on Friday. So normally I would agree with the both of you wholeheartedly. 
And Mark, everything that you're saying is right, because that's what the both of us were taught in the world of the WWE. Never, never be a distraction. Don't take eyes and ears off of the other person. Yada, yada. I completely get it. But one of you tell me, what did you see or what did you hear? by John Cena's antics that took attention away from L.A. Knight. I don't think it took attention away Wait, in the... Look at how you already started. No, but you're not, you're not letting me finish. I don't think... Let me... Are you going to... You asked me a question. Are you going to let me answer Dave, it or no? Don't get pissed off for no reason. I was just analyzing the first couple of words that you're saying. In just your first couple of words you're already going down the road of I don't think it took attention away where you opened with I thought I don't think it, took attention I don't think away. it took it I don't think it took much attention away from the people that are in the arena but it definitely took attention away from the people who are watching home on t on television for sure if that is your opinion I'll respect it like I said nine out of ten times I agree what what was John Cena reacting to? He was reacting to what L.A. Knight was saying, right? Yes. What I thought he was doing is reinforcing. Because if I'm at home and I see John Cena popping for what L.A. Knight said to Roman Reigns, I'm more likely to pop too. It's a very, very subliminal thing that goes on within pro wrestling. If Cena is not there, and L.A. Knight says something that's disrespectful to the tribal chief because they hold the tribal chief in very high esteem. So it would be very easy for L.A. Knight to say something to him and the people go, ooh, you haven't been around long enough to get away with that. But if he says something that's a little edgy and Cena's eyes go wide or Cena pops for it and goes, oh, Mark, you were talking with Denise about a wrap off, I believe, on Saturday. Right. You've been out like I've been in my show, a wrap off. You know that when somebody hits a line and the boys go, oh. You're popping because everybody else is popping. You're kind of following the rest of the herd. You're kind of like a sheep. And I don't mean sheep in a bad way in those situations. So the live crowd was reacting the way we wanted them to. The home crowd, if they see John Cena popping for the L.A. Night joke, they're going to want to pop for the L.A. Night joke. And that's why I think Cena was in the background doing this stuff to lend credibility. Because if Cena pops for the burn, we all pop for the burn. See, I, I agree with everything you're saying, Bully, but here's it's the just issue. just the overproduction of it. It, it was like, like if, yeah, because what Mark is saying is 100% right, Bully, because if you're saying something, if you're talking, and you're being serious, this is your opportunity. This is your first real opportunity to be, fun, be in front of the world champion, and you're talking to him, and I'm behind you, and you're saying to me, Dave, I just need you to reinforce what I'm saying, react to what I'm saying because there's going to be an audience watching on TV. Because that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think that that the the audience in attendance could really see. I think this was more for the camera and more for the TV audience, Bully. But if, I am go if I'm going, like, if I'm overacting and I'm making, like, and I'm making it really obvious, like, where it's like what, what you're saying is almost like a joke. That's how I felt that John Cena came across on Friday. It was way too much like it's one thing if you if you gave a burn and you're like and you back up or you or your mouth or like you a go, wow oh, oh yeah yeah put your mouth yeah put your hand over your mouth and over like, your oh, mouth that's not the way he was doing it bully the way he was doing it was bully, like he was i i know i saw oh my god oh yeah. shit, a big panama oh, it took away from it almost like it was it a, like what away. he was saying was a joke like you said something and this is this is where i i found like just what you said is the way I thought of it. Because you said, Bully, like, if he makes a joke, like, he made what L.A. Knight was saying was, like, as if it was a joke, and it wasn't a joke. 
This was his one time to stand toe-to-toe to Roman. There was no joke there. And I felt like John Cena made it seem like it was a joke to me. In, in my my opinion, in the WWE's eyes, uh, Cena is left out there for two reasons. Obviously, if Cena is on your TV, you're sticking on it. It's there for mm-hmm. a ratings, uh, a ratings uh, ploy. Right. Secondly, yeah. I think he's there to react to everything that LA Knight says to get it over even more to make the people at home understand even more that if John Cena is popping for it, you should be popping for it too. However, I will, I, I, I'm I, not even going to necessarily agree, but I see your point of view when it comes to him being too over the top with his reactions, where instead of reinforcing the point of, wow, he really got you, Cena is like making a mockery of the lines. Right. Th- thank you. O- o- overreaction. That's it. But, uh, that's but, all but, it was. And But Bully just said it, and that's how it came across to me, Bully, is it was almost like he was mocking what he was saying. That's how like I felt like a little over the line. And I think... And I think, Bully, and I understand what you're saying about having the credibility of John Cena there. I kind of think that you had John Cena there. He was the one that started the segment. He was the one that said, I don't I don't deserve it. I haven't earned a shot at your title, but this man has, and LA Knight comes out. I think that was enough. Like, I think right there, John Cena has already given LA Knight the shine. I think, I think John Cena could have been completely out of the shot at that point, because you've introduced LA Knight, you put the shine on LA Knight. Now give LA Knight the opportunity to live or die on the microphone. LA Knight you could also no, show him. no, don't give him the opportunity to live or die. That is not the way to think, because now there's a fifty percent chance he's going to die, and thus you've shot yourself in the foot just by saying, "Well, live or die" against Roman. Well, if he can't, if but but you, bully, you're if he not can't... giving your talent the best opportunity to live. You just put LA Knight in a 50-50 situation where if he fails, he has failed up against Then Roman. he shouldn't be in that opportunity. No, then he shouldn't have that opportunity true. then. That is because he's true. had enough time. Well, first of all, he shines. So it doesn't really it's it's it, it's not even a a, a conversation cuz he shined. I feel like John Cena took away from that shine. So what you're saying is like if he's not able to do it, you have John Cena to be there as his backdrop. But I think by having him shine, which he did, it really hurt him having John Cena behind him. I do not feel that it did. But if I'm going to put L.A. Knight in the ring with Roman Reigns, and we know that they have confidence in L.A. Knight right now, but L.A. Knight is a bunch of taglines, correct? Yes. We we did get some bottom end, some base, some meat from him up against Roman uh, on Friday night. But to leave him out there with the potential that he could get eaten up by Roman is not a smart idea. So what do we do? We leave Cena out there with him. That's how you protect stars from themselves. That's how you make stars. It, it, so it's it's in case to... of emergency break glass. Correct. Mark, you were surrounded by God. When you first started in the nation, did you look like you belonged? No. No, yes, you did. Yes. Well, because... I look like I belong, but 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 in, you couldn't but hand in reality, me the microphone. But you did but you didn't belong, but you didn't belong because you were so young in the business, but you fit the mold of what the group was but you were insulated with guys that just in case mark henry had to stick or just in case we had a spot for mark henry and mark henry happened to fumble on that day we had ron simmons there we had the godfather there who could just take the stick away even delo i'm not even going to mention rocky because rocky is as young as you at the time in the business so we got three other veterans there to insulate you guys just in case you fell down 
Same thing with LA Knight and, and John Cena. Cena's there just in case LA Knight falls down. And this way he doesn't lose any steam in the fans' eyes. Bully, so okay, what do you do it. now? What do you do now? Like you have to break away at some point you have to break away from John Cena. Was that the break off uh, Friday night at SmackDown? A considerable step forward. Yeah, it's it's a it's a little bit different, Dave, when uh you start to banter back and forth. Um that's what I was saying on Saturday. Uh with the sound bites and getting the crowd hype and making the acknowledgement and uh you know face to face introduction with Roman is a lot more simple than if um LA Knight would uh, approach Roman with the uh why are you sitting at home uh but and you had a lot of days under your belt but not a lot of matches and then people go oh really and then roman said oh i know who you are you're that knockoff version of my cousin oh ho, ho. now when those those things start happening back and forth you have to be glib you have to be aware of yourself and you got to be aware of, you know what? I got to go toe to toe with this guy. Miz is the best at it. It's like, I think Miz looks in the mirror for hours and just imagines himself in a one-on-one -on -one with anybody. That's how prepared he seems when Miz is out there. LA Knight is not there. You see what happened when he got in there with Miz. No, he got we, we talked about it on the show that Miz he got eviscerated. Yeah, he did. So he maybe really did. they learned by that. Maybe they saw what happened with LA Knight and the Miz, and they said, Okay, we know this LA Knight kid is getting over. We know we want to do something with him and Roman, maybe even go to Crown Jewel, but we're not a hundred percent on him. What do we do as a company to protect him? Well, but, but let me ask you, Bully and Mark, if you're not sure, if like, in, and going back to what Mark just said about him going toe to toe with the Miz, and the Miz, you know, winning that battle handedly, if you don't think he's ready, don't then maybe do you wait before putting him in a position with Roman Reigns? I mean, you can't, you be can't. because they, they the, because you only the have the one opportunity. So yeah. like, so like, is it better, Bully? to wait before putting L.A. Knight there in a program with Roman Reigns if you're not sure that he's 100% ready? No, because you know he's been taking steps forward, whether that's big steps forward or baby steps forward. So as long as he continues to move forward, and oh, by the way, he's the number one merch seller right now in the company, it flip-flops between him and Cody. Yeah. So he's doing so well on merchandise. People are chanting like, Four of his taglines, right? You got to continue to move him forward, but you got to move him forward in a way where he's not going to expose himself. Right now, remember the tip of the iceberg um, analogy I gave about Jade Cargill? Mm -hmm. Yep. That is L.A. Knight right now also. L.A. Knight is tip of the iceberg. What we're seeing is a guy who's got a lot of swagger who looks cool, who the people are into when they see him, who's got a couple of taglines. That's all tip of the iceberg stuff. Now, what lies beneath? Because what lies beneath is what's going to generate the real money for him and the company. And if we're, if we're worried about what lies beneath, let's take every necessary precaution to make sure that he does not stumble. It, I, I, think, I think Mark might understand, uh, not might, I think Mark understands this now that I've explained yeah, it. it a lot more because he's seen it done to other guys or it, yeah. or maybe even with himself, you know, whatever. Like, why did, why did John Cena, why was in John Cena in the, in the, in Mark's retirement uh, spot? Why, why was he the guy, Mark? 
because he had one, he had the title and two, he was the guy and he gave validation to everything that I was saying. And he was along for the ride. And by the time you picked him up and dropped him, they were ready to just turn, they were ready, the, you yeah. know? So you, you put guys. But when he was on the apron with me, the only reaction that he did was spontaneous is he tried to give me the title. And I was able to go back and forth with him and go, no, I don't, I don't deserve that. Like, just like he just did. So, like, those were moments that were, that stuff wasn't planned. He stood there on the apron and he cried like everybody else. That was that was the difference. If he would have been on the apron going, oh, overreacting, it would have took away from what I was doing. That's and that's, what Dave is. But your yeah, moment, that's what I'm your moment didn't call for any of that overreacting. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna right. sit here and argue or discuss the overreacting because I can see that point of view. I can see just on the surface why you guys would think like that's too much. That's overreacting. But if if you remember what we were taught from day one in this business is that ring is our Broadway stage and you always yeah. want everything to be bigger. Right. So he gave right. us big reactions. That was, he, he did what he was trained to do. Um, he also knew that I could handle my end. Um, if they are under the impression that LA Knight cannot, and he is a safety valve for L.A. Knight, then I can see why he did what he did. But it also felt like to me, watching it on Friday, like as if John Cena didn't have confidence that the fans were going to react that the way that they did. Because John, John Cena is over. John Cena is one of the greatest WWE superstars of all time. But L.A. Knight is hot right now. I don't think you needed that. I don't think you, you were still going to get those reactions. Like, I don't think that it's it, because it, it, of it Roman, failed. Dave. It's because he's in the ring with Roman and people like Roman. People cheer for Roman. People put the one in the air. It's not like Roman is looked at as this hated heel. He's a heel that people want to see get defeated. And we want to see the, de the decline and the demise of Roman's empire. But if L.A. Knight goes up to Roman, and L.A. Knight is still a young buck within the WWE, despite being a 40-year-old man, and he starts getting in Roman's face going, blah, 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 yeah. Some people be like, oh, man, you don't talk to the tribal chief like that. He's, he's about to break Hulk Hogan on the number three. Like, there's people that might take offense to uh, L.A. Knight being so brash with our tribal chief. That's, That's why Cena is there. 